السلام عليكم واسعد الله مساءكم ويسرني نيابه عن مؤسس كويت التقدم العلمي والفريق التعليمي ان ارحب فيكم في لقاء الليله واستاذنكم بانه هذا اللقاء اولا اسمي زياد نجم انا المدير التنفيذي لاكاديميه التقدم العلمي واستاذنكم بانه الندوه راح تكون باللغه الانجليزيه فحننتقل للغه الانجليزيه لكن هذا لا يمنع انه التشات ممكن يكون بالعربي واذا في عندكم سؤال بتحبوا تكتبوه او اوضح انه تكتبوه باللغه العربيه ما في اي مانع احنا حنترجم الاسئله الى الانجليزي قبل ما نحولها للبرزنترز Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ziad Nijem. Um, I will be your moderator for tonight, and I am the CEO of CAFUS Academy. And on behalf of CAFUS and the education team, which is part of the Emergency Resilience Program, I welcome you to today's event. This is the third in a series of education present webinars that we've been conducting. The first one was for uh, Kuwait uh, universities operating in Kuwait, so higher education. The second one was for K-12, and this is the third, which is for the international experience, and it's exclusively for a remarkable university on the online arena, or otherwise, which is the Arizona State University. Um, before we start, if just I can ask you to all stand up for the national anthem. Just kidding. That was the old, outdated way of doing webinars and events. Um, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Salam al Hajwaf, the Deputy Director General of Strategic Trust and Programs who's going to give a short welcoming note. So, Dr. Salem, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. I was standing then, I, I just sat down uh, after your uh, the anthem joke. Uh, good evening, uh, our audience, uh, respected audience uh, in Kuwait, and good afternoon, our speakers, and also our audience who are following us from the state. So we have to say good evening and good morning at the same time. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today in one of our uh, seminars or webinars that uh, KFS um, uh, trying to fill the gap through uh, since the start of this uh, pandemic. Uh, as uh, Ziad said, um, in fact, we, we, we are in the fourth seminar, uh, not the third. Um, every Wednesday, we used to have uh, one seminar, the first topic was the, to cover the local universities and how they dealt with the remaining part of uh, the fall sem uh, semester uh, last year. Uh, the second one was dedicated for grade 6 to grade 12 uh, in the public schools and private schools as well. And last Wednesday we covered the kindergarten and elementary school till grade 5. Um, each time we have different audience, we have different uh, point of view, but we have the same concerns and we have the same questions that are raised by, by the stakeholders, whether students, parents, teachers, decision makers. Uh, today, uh, we will move abroad to see what other leading universities uh, like Arizona State University doing uh, in this current uh, pandemic and how they manage uh, their operation uh, through uh, or under this uh, new uh, circumstances. Um, of course, uh, Arizona State University is one of the leading universities in the world started uh, a few attempts uh, since early 2000 to accommodate and utilize the technology through distance learning and uh, uh, online learning. Uh, it is a public school with 17 college. I'm not advertising for uh, Arizona State University, but this is fact uh, about the school. Uh, they have almost 5,000 faculty members and 130,000 uh, students, including some Kuwaiti students. Arizona State University also 
uh, ranked as uh, five times most innovative university in the States, uh, beating MIT, Stanford, and other leading universities. Uh, it is on the top five best online bachelor uh, program. They have more than 150 undergraduate and graduate programs offered online and about 40,000 online uh, students regularly registered uh, in the school. Of course, among uh, our speakers, we're supposed to have Professor uh, Stephanie Lindiquis, a senior vice president of Global Academic Initiative. Uh, but there has been an unfortunate last minute change in the, in the, in the speaker since Professor uh, Stefani uh, is on a pregnant uh, leave due to the death of member of her immediate uh, family members. On behalf of uh, KFAS family and all our today's audience, I send Professor uh, Linda West our deepest condolences for her loss. We are grateful uh, to have with us today uh, Dr. Julie uh, Greenwood, Vice Dean for Education Initiatives, who will give us uh, a more details on a practitioner's side on the production of online courses and the myth surrounding it uh, worldwide. Uh, also, uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Julian Rosen, Managing Director of Global Academic Partnership, who will give us uh, uh, a briefing about institutional and administration, uh, administrative view on online education. Last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome our audience tonight who came from different spectrum of the community, students, faculty members from both public and private uh, universities in Kuwait, ASU alumni in Kuwait, uh, who are many, um, and they are uh, doing great job in the community right now and also some of the current uh, students who are officially registered at uh, ASU, but currently studying their courses, the, the, the all course uh, online from here, from Kuwait. Also, we'd like to welcome parents and decision makers, including head of culture attache offices of Kuwait and DC and Los Angeles, who are looking after Kuwaiti students in the state. Thank you all for joining us today to listen and learn from, from the experience of Arizona State University in the last few uh, months and, be, and before. With this, I will leave uh, the floor or the screen back to Ziad. Thank you. Dr. Salem, um, today's topic is, is about online um, degrees, online education, which is not necessarily as an um, an emergency mode which happened in Kuwait in the past few months due to COVID-19. Uh, the, the idea of today's seminar is how do we build on the um, momentum that's going on the online front and moving it to become part of the education. I'm going to take up an opportunity here and just quickly introduce to you one of KFAS centers which are related to today's topic, which is KFAS Academy. Uh, KFAS Academy has been established three years ago in 2017. It's a wholly owned, not-for-profit company owned by KFAS, and we work in the digital and online learning. Um, Till March 2017, we were mainly concerned with higher education and professional development, post-graduation professional development. However, we've been working on K-12 education as part of the ERP mobilization. The ERP program is the emergency resilience program that KFAS has launched back in April of 2020 in response of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to support government over, um, efforts by leveraging all of our expertise and network and resources for that mission. The program it enables us to respond uh, effectively to the pandemic in four ma main areas, public health, education, business environment, and civil society organizations. So this is in brief uh, the context of, of how KFAS is responding to uh, COVID-19 in general and which of its centers is mainly concerned with the online and the digital learning. I would like to briefly take five minutes of your time, I promise no more than five minutes, 
and then I will uh, introduce our speakers and let them take the lead. But I would like to con take this opportunity to bring the audience uh, a little bit uh, closer to home, and I'll be discussing very briefly, introducing two projects that KFAS Academy has been working on or is working on where um, is, is of relevance to today's talk. The first is what we are calling Kuwait Collegiate Online Consortium. This is something we started promoting between some of the universities. And the idea is basically for the Kuwaiti, for the universities in Kuwait to start a, um, exchanging some of the online courses between their students. So this is why we call it the consortium. We feel that this is a collaborative and a competitive framework that will uh, entice and excite the university, local universities to move online. And especially post COVID-19, the distribution and the parallel implementation of courses could be very helpful in moving as many courses as we can to online. Uh, more, also as important is that it will allow cost sharing and cost recovery of the expenses uh, needed to move to some of the courses to online courses and it might even allow to some level of specialization between universities where certain universities will shine in, in certain subjects and be responsible of, of giving this, uh, these courses to other universities uh, locally and then they can exchange credit between themselves. This is, this is, we feel this is a safe environment. Everybody is operating under the guidance, guidelines of um, PUC in Kuwait. They're all accredited, they're all recognized. Um, so it might be a good starting point for moving online. The other idea, and this is, brings me closer to uh, our relationship with Arizona State University, is what we're calling the on-campus online university which is taking the online, an online university and build a campus, a complete campus around it to provide two things, provide services for the students to guarantee the, the, that they are getting the most out of um, their online experience, that they, we help them manage their time rather than getting lost in, in the online. We give them the campus experience of, of, for student life uh, livelihood, uh, living, excuse me, and um, that's on one hand. The other hand, it would help the regulators, the Ministry of Higher Education, to uh, build trust on the, um, the actual online degree that the student is, uh, is, is, is getting. Um, for more information, please feel free to email anybody at the KFAS Academy and we'll get in touch with you. With that, maybe the next logical question is why did we decide to partner with ASU? Um, I realize today this is a six months old slide, so a th few things might have changed, but the general, at the general theme of the slide is still valid. ASU is not just ranked in the top five of the online ranking, it is by far larger than any of the other top five in the number of programs and the number of students. As Dr. Salim mentioned, named number one in the innovation for five consecutive years. It is a renowned public university and undergraduate university, regardless whether you're going online or not. And um, it's taught and operated by the same faculty and administrating as the, the on-campus university. Finally, that all the programs are accredited, including uh, ABET accreditation for engineering programs. We feel these are all positive points that should, uh, uh, this is why we decided to partner with them. As um, Dr. Salem mentioned, unfortunately, Professor uh, Lindquist uh, couldn't be with us and uh, I sent her my personal uh, condolences for her loss. Um, we have uh, two speakers today, each will go for about 20 minutes, and then we will have um, 
probably more than 30 minutes of, of the allotted time for the question answer. We will be, feel free to put your question in the chat whenever you feel like you have a question. We'll be collecting them. And when we go to the question answer, I will be uh, going through them. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover most of them. Our first speaker, as I said, is Julia Rosen. Julia is the Managing Director for Global Academic Partnership at Arizona, which means she's responsible for uh, all new partnerships that is happening with pri whether private organizations, government, which will expand the outreach of ASU's global impact. Before that, she worked with uh, also at ASU with Global Launch, which has worked in English and other languages, uh, training, working uh, workforce skills, uh, academic culture, and capacity building. She was also an associate vice provost for the ASU online. In 2010, and this is something that is really interesting, is the partnership that she uh, managed to form between JSV, which is a venture capitalist um, organization, uh, into something they called ASU JSV Education Innovation Summit. It's an annual event, and I believe it's going to be online very soon. Uh, hopefully, uh, probably we'll put one of the questions on the JSV. It's, it's a very interesting concept between private sector and education. With that, I'll mute my mic and my camera, and I will ask Julia, please, to join us. And we will switch the slides to Julia's presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your time today, and especially a huge thanks to our colleagues at KFAS, um, not only for your condolences for Dr. Lindquist's loss, but also your warm welcome. Um, I'm particularly excited to know that there are Kuwaiti students, uh, uh, some of our students uh, in the audience. So hello, students. Uh, we really appreciate uh, having you on campus and having you part of our ASU community and um, appreciate your time here today or tonight, uh, wherever you may be. Well, I wanted to start off by talking about ASU's recent experience uh, since COVID hit, and then bring together how our mission, strategy, and execution are all aligned uh, that prepared us for this most recent experience, to the extent that anybody could possibly be prepared for that. So what's happened? Uh, since March, um, ASU was able to move 75,000 of our campus immersion students to online and remote instruction in just seven days. We created ASU Sync, which is a fully immersive technology-enabled modality. And we've also outfitted 150 classrooms across campus to be sync enabled. So what does that actually mean? It means that some of our classes are open for both in-person and remote instruction, and that students and faculty members can choose whether to attend in person or remotely. And so I call this our COVID flex solution. So as conditions get better, more people might choose to attend in person. If conditions get worse, some people, more people might choose to attend in remote, but we do think COVID's gonna be around for a while. So as we're looking at our strategies, not only for instruction and learning, but also for housing, we have various flexible modalities that we can tighten or loosen based on the overall um, environment in Tempe and Arizona. But overall, we've done great in fall of 2020. Uh, we basically maintained our enrollment um, we've increased by 7% the enrollment across all programs, but a lot of that has to do with a huge increase in our online student enrollment, which I'm sure is not a surprise. Uh, we have decreased, of course, in our in-person enrollment, and a lot of that, of course, unfortunately, um, is with our international students. 
So as my colleagues at KFAST pretty much have done a lot of my work for me, uh, we had a head start. Why were we able to flex, uh, to flex so quickly and to move into this new modality so quickly is that we had a head start. ASU Online informally probably started in the mid aughts, but under its current leadership started in 2009. Um, and now we have 50,000 fully online students. And these are degree seeking students. So this 50,000 does not count the other 30 or 40,000 of our campus immersion students who might be taking individual online courses at any point in time. So, excuse me about that. So how were we able to do that? We did that because our mission and strategy and execution were all aligned. And really everything, our mission and everything that we do flows from this document, our charter. And we would argue that while most universities, every university has some sort of mission statement that under President Michael Crow's leadership and our communication team, the extent to which our students and faculty and alums understand our mission and how it's different from other universities is really quite profound. So there's a couple of elements here that's really important. First, we measure ourselves by who we include, not who we exclude. And as I'm sure many of you know, if not all of you, rankings, certainly in the United States, the quote unquote best university are measured by how many students they reject. Oh, if you reject 10% students, you're better than a university that rejects 20% students. And I might argue that people that are capable of getting into those universities that are very elite or exclusive probably will do well no matter where they go to school. ASU, we target people. Everyone who meets admission standards is admitted, but we target students whose lives will be transformed for having attended ASU. Another huge part of our mission is the fact that we take responsibility for the social and economic well-being of the communities that we serve. And so this plays out in a number of different ways. So we've got our mission and, and the next level of communication and direction within ASU are our design aspirations. These are specific ways in which we accomplish our mission and our charter. And let me just focus on one in particular, which is transform society. Um, ASU Online was formed in, in a very deliberate way to address a big problem in the United States. 36 million students, or actually I should say adults in the United States, started college but never completed it. They wanted to complete college, but maybe their family obligations got in the way, they had economic hardship, uh, they had health problems. And so ASU Online was designed for students who started but wanted to complete. And by definition, these are students by now who are working adults, they have families, and are very, very busy and had no chance of coming to campus. So that's what got us started. Overall, ASU has doubled our population in the 16 years, um, not only online, but huge increases in our on-campus enrollment. But as you can see here, rather than um, just serving more of the same types of students, we diversified the students that we've served as we've increased the total number of students we've educated. One particular metric I like to focus on is the number of first generation students. And by first generation students, I mean somebody who is their first in the family to have gone to college. And in fact, um, ASU President Michael Crow was the first in his family to have gone to college. And the reason why this is so important is not only because we believe a university education is the single most important tool for social economic transformation, but also once one person in the family goes to college, that has an amazing cascading effect on what's possible for everybody else, the sisters and the brothers and the aunts and the uncles and the cousins. So as you can see, as, as we have um, increased the population, our overall service, uh, our number of first generation students has tripled. 
So now we have our strategy, right? So how do we really go down and think about creating a culture of innovation? And as you've heard already a couple of times, uh, we've been recognized for our culture of innovation and uh, we're very proud of that. And I think the next few slides might explain a couple of the specific um, reasons why uh, we've been designated the most innovative university for five years in a row in the United States. Let me start off with research. And research is really important um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's an amazing metric of faculty excellence. I mean, we do have five Nobel laureates. We have National Academy members, Pulitzer Prize winners. We have faculty members who have won the highest academic awards in their field. But research is a competition between the best minds of universities in the United States for US government dollars. As you can see, we've dramatically increased the amount of our research. We've increased the, at the rate we've done it compared to our peers. We're in the top 10 as it relates to our peers. These are universities without medical schools. But perhaps what's most important is that number 12 ranking at the bottom of the slide. And on a worldwide basis, ASU is number 12 in terms of the numbers of patents it holds. And why is that important? It is possible, of course, to do very theoretical research that advances the knowledge in the field, but we really focus on doing research that is applied to real world problems. So by obtaining patents, we can then protect this intellectual property and license it to companies who then create products and services that solve some of the most important problems in the world. We also track our economic impact. Uh, we pay close attention to the number of jobs we create in Arizona and how many companies we create and our economic development um, footprint in Arizona. Another element of how we do our business is a bias towards partnership. Uh, many universities have what we call the not invented here syndrome, which is we didn't invent it and must not be good enough. If anything, ASU has a different, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, which is, are we sure we are the people that have spent the most time and energy worrying about a problem? Or are there other people in the world that might have a better solution and we might be able to partner with to move faster and better? So as we started ASU online, we started with a partnership to have someone at the time who could help us with marketing and enrollment services and capabilities that ASU did not have. Throughout all of our courses, and, and Dr. Green will talk about this a little bit more, we have technology embedded to create a fantastic student experience and bring the online, bring the learning experience to life in ways that actually are not possible in a face-to-face -face classroom. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about ASU online in particular, and starting with the most important thing, which is this is the core values. This is how we went about it. And by the way, say when, when I say we, um, I mentioned that we started in 2009, and that was under the leadership of Dr. Phil Regeer. ASU Online is now part of a broader unit called um, Ed Plus, and Dr. Regeer heads that as well. And that is ASU Central Education or Central um, Innovation Unit. But it all started with ASU Online. So our core values, as Dr. Ziad mentioned just a bit, is we apply the same curriculum, same standards, same educational rigor, same level of faculty engagement as ASU's face-to-face -face classes. Our transcripts are the same, so when you get a degree from ASU, it does not matter whether it's from ASU online, ASU face ASU Sync, it is ASU. And of course, faculty are research intensive, highly productive faculty are core to everything we do. Many uh, 
private universities don't have a research intensive faculty and many public universities choose not to use their research intensive faculty as the core of their online program but rather have a separate faculty that are just teaching and devoted to online learning. That's not our approach. We will only put degree programs online if we can do it as well or better than our face-to-face -face campus experience. So our approach, as you, I'll let you read that, involves faculty and education and services. But I wanted to talk now about the degree to which ASU as an institution put ASU online in the middle. So what do I mean by that? Um, at least in the United States, AS, AS, online students expect to start at least five times a year. Traditional face-to-face -face campuses at least have one start in the fall, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere. Sometimes two starts at the beginning of the fall, let's say in September, maybe in January. But these working adults, if they're interested in education and the way the market had evolved in the United States, they can't wait a year, they can't wait six months. If they want to do it, they need to do it now. So ASU broke our calendar, redesigned our calendar for our face-to-face -face students in order to accommodate and make sure that ASU Online would be successful. So, for example, we have three fall semesters. We have a fall A semester, that is the first seven and a half weeks. We have a fall B semester, that is the second seven and a half weeks. And we have a fall C semester, which is 15 weeks. So this is an example, along with our admission services and financial services, the way ASU as its core has benefited by having a strong online program truly built into the core of the university. Here is a diagram of the various aspects that come onto the student support platform. And, and I think all of us would recognize, well, yes, we need faculty and yes, we need technology and maybe that's all we need. But the next couple of slides, I wanna talk about the role of the student success coaches and the instructional designers as being integral to our being able to provide uh, top tier student experience. So student success coaches, it's, that's kind of a term of art, um, but these are not academic advisors. These are folks that help students manage their time with goal setting. So they help students, again, who are mostly working adults, have multiple obligations, extremely busy, make their online education a priority within the context of their lives. Another critical role is that of instructional designer. So maybe some faculty members know everything about all the technology, and maybe they're also experts in online pedagogy. But in our experience, our faculty members don't necessarily have all of this knowledge. And so there's a group of people called instructional designers. And I call them the integration layer between the faculty on one side and what is possible pedagogically due to the tons of different types of technologies and tools and services that exist in the marketplace and that ASU uses as part of our ASU online program. So our instructional designers work with the subject matter experts or faculty, and then together they create top quality, top student experience courses. Uh, Dr. Ziad already mentioned uh, one of our signature events, which is the ASU GSV Summit coming up on September 29th, fully virtual and fully free this year. But this is the reason I show this is that this is to show how intent we are about partnerships. So we basically created our own marketplace. We call it, well, internally partner shopping, where we bring together and partnered with GSV, who is an investment firm uh, called Global Silicon Valley, based in Silicon Valley, but again, with a very global outlook, where we bring together investors and entrepreneurs and thought leaders to create a singular conversation, something that the New York Times has recognized as the must attend educational event in the United States at least. So you see we've got some pretty fancy folks here and I invite you to join us um, in uh, late September. 
Finally, I wanted to provide one more example of how our, our online uh, program has influenced and, and made better ASU as a whole. So uh, several years ago, we began a partnership with Starbucks and Starbucks wanted to provide a different type of benefit to their employees. So they wanted to provide a free education to their employees. And it's free because Starbucks invested, because ASU, we lowered our prices and because there are loans available from the US federal government. But Starbucks wanted this to be super useful to people so students did not have to all study retail management or something to their career. They wanted it to be really special. So we are very excited about this. But what happened? Many of these Starbucks employees did not meet our admission standards. So rather than rejecting them, we created an entire new pathway called an earned admissions pathway. And here's the theory. Rather than using test scores and your grade point average of how you did at high school or how you did at another university, what about showing or deciding how you're going to do at ASU? The best way to determine that is by giving you ASU coursework. So these students take ASU coursework. If they do well in ASU coursework, they're admitted to ASU. So I think it's just a fantastic example of our commitment to access and to continually opening up ASU to the world. And all of this is because we have our mission and our strategy and our execution all aligned, uh, specifically designed under the leadership of President Crow. And I thank you very much for your time and look forward to answering questions later. And um, just give me a second to bring up my slides. Um, our second speaker is actually from from the battlefield. Uh, Dr. Julie uh, Greenwood is the Vice Dean of Educational Initiatives. She is with Ed Plus, the unit that Julia mentioned as the unit responsible for turning the courses to online courses, which means that uh, Dr. Greenwood works with the academic units of all campuses, including from the top hierarchy all the way up to the faculty and the, uh, the staff. Her job is to drive course development that transforms student learning experiences to, to online. She works with instructional design. I'm just gonna mention the keywords here so that this might bring questions to your, to your mind. Uh, she works with instructional designers, new media assessment, compliance, adaptive and personalized learning, Ed Plus Action Lab, data analytics, education technology, and I think that's enough. We don't have time for more questions other than those <laughs> terms. And if that wasn't enough, she's a professor of neuroscience and associate professor, excuse me, in the School of Mathematics and Natural Science in New College at ASU. Um, welcome, Julie. Uh, Chab will bring up your presentation and the mic is with you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I feel so honored to have this opportunity to share the work that we've done at uh, ASU. And I look forward to engaging with you when we have uh, questions and answers. So this, this is uh, a presentation that we uh, have found very effective at engaging faculty and administrators about you know, the transition from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching and learning. Uh, it really focuses in on, on some of the, the 10 misconceptions that we most frequently in, engage upon or receive questions about. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of jump in. Uh, they're not necessarily in, in any order, but we do kind of like to have a little fun by doing a countdown. Okay. 
So let's start with uh, number 10, and that's that uh, minority students do worse online than other students and worse than if they attended a face-to-face -face environment. Well, that's certainly not true. Uh, what we have found is uh, that the reality is as long as you create a quality learning environment and experience that's supported by faculty, uh, we see success from all of our demographic groups and that that success in, in terms of the academic experience and learning is equivalent to what our students have on campus. And I'm going to share some data from the Action Lab. And so this really just looks at uh, the cumulative uh, grades in over 5,000 courses pairing students uh, who were fully online versus students fully on campus. And the data reflects uh, about uh, 25,000 students. And what you'll notice is we look across um, six, in this particular slide, six different demographics from sex to economic status to first generation students, as Julia explained, part-time, full-time, uh, their incoming GPA, which is often an indicator of preparedness, as, as well as race. And you can see it's a direct comparison between the digital, which is online, and campus, which is our face-to-face -face environments. And for the most part, we see equivalent success uh, across campus and ASU online. Where we do see a slightly greater difference is when we look at retention or, or persistence in the programs. And that primarily the, the number one factor that influences success both online and campus is whether the students are full-time or part-time. Part-time students, uh, what we're finding typically uh, are not retained at the same rate as full-time students. And so we continue to iterate and find ways to support those students, uh, both inside and outside of the classroom. In many cases, it's, it's uh, for non-academic reasons that those students are not retained. And that's one of the reasons why we have uh, success coaches, which help to support those students uh, through their academic journey. So another myth is that uh, online learning is a passive experience um, performed in isolation by the learner. Well, actually, I would argue that after teaching face-to-face -face classes uh, for 15 years uh, that ranged anywhere from 20 students to over 200 students in the classroom, Often the classroom experience is actually very passive. Uh, what I have found with my online classes is all students have to participate. Uh, and all students have to participate on an almost uh, on a very frequent, uh, certainly a weekly, if not daily basis. And this happens through you know, discussion groups, uh, through the creation of a student community, peer review, I think is, a, is an excellent way to engage students. Um, but certainly it is a much more active process than what we see in our face classrooms. Uh, this is a quote from one of our art professors uh, at Arizona State where she's observed that students really develop relationships uh, as they're examining and sharing critique about each other's work. And this is in, in one of our more unique uh, programs at ASU uh, with a degree in digital photography. So another really common myth that we get questions about is that employers won't hire online graduates. Well, I, you know, I'll agree that there were a lot of questions, you know, in the beginning around the quality of an online degree. Uh, but over time, as you can see these quotes from the experts, uh, particularly with students at ASU where it's the same learning outcomes, the same faculty, the same degree, and the same transcript, 
we're finding that our students are actually quite competitive. And with many of our online students, they're upskilling and are getting promoted within their own, uh, their current position uh, of work. And so actually, uh, students from online do quite well uh, in the marketplace and moving on to graduate school and medical school. So the next myth is that online students couldn't get admitted to a real university. Well, uh, we work very hard to make sure that uh, all ASU students, both uh, online and campus, meet the exact same admission standards. And this kind of just gives you some data comparing those admission standards and the persistence of those students through their uh, first term. And you can see just comparing the two uh, that they're quite equivalent and the standards and rigor and learning outcomes uh, between both online and campus are identical. Another myth is that online cannibalizes face-to-face. -face. Well, actually, there are uh, very different populations of students that access these two different modalities. And what you see is with our campus students, this uh, is more of a traditional aged student. Uh, often these students are full-time, focused entirely on their education, have not yet entered the workforce. However, online opened up this opportunity, this access to a completely different population of students who were not able to access uh, the uh, campus education. And so these students on average are about 29 years old. Many of them are working or taking care of their families. Um, and even as we're starting to see uh, amazing growth uh, there are numerous students who have started uh, education in a face-to-face -face environment, but had to stop for a variety of reasons. And uh, in the United States, there's over 35 million individuals um, who've had to discontinue their education due to finances or their uh, circumstances with their family. Uh, this is a, a target population for us, and those students are actually going back to school and enrolling at in ASU Online and in other uh, online universities at a very high rate. So this is probably my favorite. As, um, as a biochemist, uh, it's, I I'm, uh, find it interesting that um, my colleagues feel that you can't teach science online. Um, and probably even um, more interesting is that online labs are lousy. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, share a video with you uh, and I'm gonna let some of my uh, favorite colleagues uh, kind of talk about some of what they've done in terms of labs. Uh, this is usually a, a very interesting topic is the traditional classroom lab to an online environment, allowing students to fully immerse in the lab experience. From a teaching and learning perspective, these laboratory activities are essential for learning important concepts and procedures, improving science literacy, and pursuing a successful career in a related profession. In other words, lab experiences provide opportunities to interact directly with the material of the world, use the tools, apply data collection techniques, and create scientific models. Labs that are offered in the digital online environment can be categorized into the following types. Digital simulations, lab kits, kitchen labs, and video-based labs. Digital simulations are interactive labs that occur in a simulated environment via software or web-based applications. These types of labs provide an experimental foundation for the concepts introduced in online lectures. What we can do in virtual reality is essentially make anything possible. You can go anywhere, do anything, work with any type of equipment, no matter how expensive or rare it is, because we just create it virtually. For example, in the course University Physics Lab 1, students use computer simulations to experiment with objects and momentum. The outcomes are for students to observe the conservation of momentum. Lab Kit. Lab kits are commercial kits that students order to conduct labs at home. As an example, in the biology course Vertebrate Zoology, 
students purchase a pre-selected kit of tools. In this biology course, the lab component is actually very unique because learners have to order a dissection kit that includes uh, dead specimens like the perch here and also all the supplies required for uh, dissecting the specimen. To guide them, several teaching assistants and AC online media team recorded instructional videos to demonstrate the various procedures. Kitchen labs. These types of labs are conducted using household or easily obtainable items and performed in the home or kitchen. Conducted using tap water, Epsom salt, plastic wrap, and a large bowl, students in the Chemistry and Society course examine the scientific principles that focus on technology, social issues, and everyday life. This specific lab results in students recognizing the effects hard water has on plumbing and household fixtures. Video labs. These lab activities are conducted by a professional on video, followed by a data set that students interpret and analyze often used for labs that are too expensive, difficult, or dangerous to complete unsupervised at home. In the engineering course Fundamentals of CMOs and MEMs, students watch a video of the lab demonstration for an etching tool in a real clean room, and then use the data from the process to work together in small groups in the online environment to complete the lab report. Online labs can teach the same concepts and procedures as traditional labs. They are more affordable, flexible, customizable, and depending on the context, much, much safer. The ASU Digital Learning Platform leverages the latest in technology combined with the authentic lab experience to deliver high quality learning experiences to ASU online students. So actually, just to close out on online labs, uh, having taught face-to-face -face online labs for several years, uh, I, we actually feel that online labs help students understand concepts better. It gives them the opportunity to focus more on the data, uh, data analysis, experimental design, and the opportunity to actually fail make mistakes and repeat much more easily. So there, there are numerous benefits. Although I, I'll say one of my favorite uh, programs at Arizona State is our biochemistry program, which has a hybrid uh, component where they bring their students to campus two consecutive summers in a row for intensive lab experiences. Uh, some, what, one summer it's with organic chemistry and the next summer it's with biochemistry. And so this is a great way for students to come to campus, get the hands-on lab experience, interact directly with their faculty, and just makes really for an awesome uh, hybrid program. So just another way to kind of, uh, another option to consider uh, how to innovate your programs as you move forward. So back to our myths. Uh, myth number four, uh, online programs are profitable because they replace expensive faculty with cheap software. Well, that's entirely not true. Actually, faculty are at the center of everything that we do. Uh, I think what's critical to online uh, design is, as Julia mentioned in her talk, is we provide faculty with a, a complete team of instructional designers, instructional technologists, um, assessment specialists, who work with those faculty with the design of the course to make it both engaging and a positive learning experience that integrates the best components of, of being an instructor into that learning experience. And so once again, I, I think having, um, a foundation of instructional designers is critical to the success of any online program. And certainly uh, Ed Plus was built on a foundation of high quality instructional designers. And these are instructional designers who are ha have a wonderful expertise on building relationships and, and supporting the faculty. So once again, the faculty are at the center of all of our learning experiences. In terms of cost, uh, typically the cost for an online course is, is greater. 
Uh, but over time, as that course is used and more and more students are able to benefit from those resources from the initial development, those costs do go down over time. Um, but ultimately, you do need to keep reiterating and making sure you're innovating on uh, your courses. So myth number three, online programs are lower quality than face-to-face -face, and they're easy, right? That's not really true. Uh, what we find is uh, there's a significant focus on formative assessment uh, in our online classes. And this actually gives students a greater opportunity to construct and, and create uh, based on the knowledge and what they've learned within the online experience. And it actually is a higher level of rigor, requires often more um, creative and um, creative energy and time from the students in order to engage with the material and demonstrate mastery of the learning outcomes. I'm gonna skip that slide because I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, all of our courses are built on a quality matters standard. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a series of metrics that our instructional designers use to help support our faculty around the different areas uh, that create a high quality engaging uh, online class. It's easier to cheat online. That, that is probably, I, I think, of my colleagues, the number one concern is, oh, students are just gonna cheat. Um, well, actually, uh, we work really hard to, and, and, and over time have, have developed the ability to design our courses in a way that they emphasize the formative assessment and actually make it very difficult for students to cheat. Uh, we also use technology designed to identify where students may have plagiarized or cheated uh, when they were constructing their work. Um, and then also we have technology that allows us to monitor students during exams. And once again, this is actually very effective. And uh, for the most part, I think many faculty after they transition to online feel that students in the classroom are probably cheating more frequently than they do uh, in an online class. And then number one, uh, best reason to go online is to make a lot of money, right? No, that's not at all why ASU went online. And, and I think Julia covered much of that around our mission. Uh, but for us, it's really important uh, to expand the access of education to those who are not able to access it with our current systems. Uh, we have found that online, creating our online programs has significantly improved the university as a whole. Um, and it's given faculty new tools. As we've designed our online courses, those tools, those designs, those courses are actually making their way back and are, are becoming the foundation for the campus courses. And so once again, it has improved ASU uh, across, I think, all modalities and in all facets of the university. I think what I will do is I will stop there as I'm out of time and I look forward to hearing your questions. for um, a very engaging discussion. Thank you, Julia, also for the overall presentation. Um, to the audience, we've posted the myths, the 10 myths as polls. If you give me a minute, I will share the last two. Um, please take the time to vote for your favorite myth whether you agree or disagree, and we will we'll be posting some of them as questions back to our speakers. Um, I will ask Julia to turn her camera on and mic on. Um, I'll be post asking the question on behalf 
of the the audience and then it's up to you to decide who's going to answer it we have a good 30 minutes for the q a so to the audience please if you have questions please put them and the administrators will mark them for me i will start with with um something that usually um happens when you hear success stories which is basically what led to the success story did it work the first time did it work the second time or is it the tenth time um, I'm re always reminded with the story when one of the venture capitalists financing Thomas Edison, when he was frustrated that um, he's taking all the money for creating the light bulb and still no light bulbs in, in the market. And one day he goes frustrated and speaks to Edison saying, I want results. And Thomas snapped back and says, you want results? I'll give you a thousand things that won't work. So um, could you briefly go over whether at the high level on the institutional for Julia or whether at the lower level for, 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 for the dynamics of, of, or the mechanics, excuse me, of, the, of, of the, uh, organizing the courses. Could you share with us pitfalls or hard lessons you have learned that as more institutes are moving into online, they should be avoiding? Well, I don't know whether, I, perhaps Julie, I'll start here and then turn it over to you, but um, um, I don't know if our experience would directly translate, but I can share with you some of our experience and institutions can decide how useful and how it might make sense in their context. But um, no, we did not get it right the first time. Um, I would say probably the third time is when we actually got it right. And that, not that the first two times was wrong, it's just that we were learning about the experience. And so there were a couple of elements, I think, that led to uh, basically, the, uh, I mentioned Dr. Revere earlier, and he came on board in 2009. There were two previous iterations of ASU Online and, and how it got um, started and people trying to do it. I think it became successful under Dr. Regeer for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first, this early decision that ASU was super honest with itself about what we could do internally and what we needed to go to the market to get. So that started off again with a big partnership for marketing uh, above everything where ASU uh, has it then and continues to have full and utter control over all the academics, all the admissions, all the curricular decisions. But some of the business processes and the marketing in particular was not something we were we knew how to do. So I think making that decision, not only on the business side, but then also with, and we can talk more to this, specific technology providers and being honest about what we could and could not do. Secondly, our provost was unbelievably supportive and our current we've had other provosts since then all continue to be supportive. And the idea is that ASU Online, as I mentioned, is the core to the university, not only changing the calendars, but things like making admissions decisions that had to be faster for online students, making them faster for everybody. Sur financial services had to be redesigned, the registrar office. So a lot of the business services that had been designed just for face-to-face -face students instead became designed for online students, which then served to the benefit of everyone. So having that level of institutional commitment and institutional humility, I would say would be the, were our two biggest early success factors and continue to be um, our strategies going forward. Julie, would you like to add anything from your side? Absolutely. So I uh, certainly I'm going to echo a little bit about what Julia has said around culture. Uh, culture is critical for the success uh, development of these programs and, and, and having the mission and the values that were established by leadership that they were actually able to take to the faculty and get buy-in from the faculty around the mission of access and student success. Certainly, uh, as Julia mentioned, it, it's critical to have enrollments, 
Uh, so you need, if you're going to build programs, you need them to be successful. I think uh, Ed Plus and, and Bill did a great job in terms of selecting programs where there was a market. Uh, and then developing the services and supports for students across that entire journey. Okay, all the way from a student expressing interest in the program, guiding the students all the way into the program, and then supporting students once they're in the program. And then I, th I think ultimately, um, if you're going to create an online program, it's not gonna work unless you have high quality courses and educational experiences. And, and that really goes back to that foundation that centers you know, the educational experience around the interactions with the faculty and what the faculty are designing in, in terms of their uh, programs and learning for their students. And so once again, that I think rounds out uh, all the different aspects that are critical to the success of ASU Online. And we continue to grow, expand, and innovate. Such, such a culture of, of innovation and experimentation and willingness to try new things that will help to support right. both our faculty uh, I'll take, and uh, our students. One question from the, from the audience, and I'll just uh, generalize it a little bit, which is, um, have you seen changes in applications for the online programs post COVID-19, whether it's because of the um, lockdown or the change, the disruption in the workforce? So probably those who got worried of becoming unemployed decided to go into um, school and retrain themselves. So do you have any um, uh, insight or data on that? And uh, if you can also contextualize it to the Middle East or the international market, not necessarily just the USA? I, I have, do you wanna answer that, Julia? Well, if you wanna start, then I'll finish sure. or, okay. Okay, great. So I, I think uh, what we've been seeing in ASU Online for the last several years is just phenomenal growth. Uh, and, and so this year we had uh, probably our, our, a record growth of over 25% increase in enrollments. Uh, so certainly we, we've been working to grow uh, all this time. Uh, so certainly COVID may have helped us you know, in terms of that growth as more and more individuals are, are looking for different opportunities. Uh, in, in terms of, of specific data, um, you know, we, we've not had as many international students in ASU Online as we would like. That's an area that we want to continue to grow and, and support different populations. Uh, as a whole, across all existing online educational opportunities, there are significant increases in access by international students. And so we're, we're starting to monitor that more carefully. Uh, I think an uh, interesting uh, growth area, uh, you know, typically we've had mostly transfer students in our ASU online population. But our fastest growing populations are our first time first year students and uh, students looking for education in STEM fields. So I just might add to that, is rather than thinking about students interested in online because COVID, they can't physically attend campuses, I think something we generally see is that whenever the economy does badly, education does well. People look at this as time to reskill, kind of get out of the workplace, you know, let the market settle and improve their own skills with the hopes of once they get their next degree or their next credential, they're better prepared and their career is still moving along. So so that's a big, big kind of historic phenomena that is more is tied more to economic conditions. But to your point about international students, I'd like to bring up a really fantastic partnership that ASU has with the Al Guerrero Foundation for Education. And the Al Guerrero Foundation is funding 100% scholarships for students in MENA to take ASU online courses. 
people need to be under 30 years old and they need to have very humble circumstances. And Al Guerrero, working with ASU Online, has chosen about 20 or so of our 200 or so degree programs, and these are all graduate degrees, and provide full scholarships to students in MENA. So there's, uh, I just checked, just in case this question would come up, uh, we have, an, I think October is the next, is the final deadline for this program. So separately, uh, I'll work with KFAS to get that information out in case people um, on this webinar or others might be interested in this. But it's a 100% fully funded scholarship All right. for ASU um, online I'll um, courses. Take a look at the program. poll. Um, people seem to agree, and with agree, I mean more than 60%. And I thank the 75% of the audience that has been participating with, with, with the poll. Uh, number 10, they seem to agree it's a myth. Number 9, which is online learning is passive. Also, audience seems to agree that it's either they agreed before or they agreed because of your argument, Julie. I cannot tell, but they also agreed. However, uh, myth number eight, which talks about employers, uh, the employability of online graduates, the audience is actually split 50-50, leaning a little bit, 6% uh, difference towards that true. It, it, it is not a myth. It is true employee. Uh, uh, I misspelled employers. I wrote employees. I apologize for that. So employers will not hire, but I'm sure the audience was smart enough to, to fix the spelling mistake. So employers will not hire online graduates. Would you like to take two minutes to give a solid argument of how this is uh, still a myth to you? So let, let me... Yeah, let, let me start with that because I think it's true and it depends what market you're talking about. So in the United States, we do not find that to be the case. But in countries like Kuwait and else in many countries around the world, especially in the Middle East, um, or not especially, but in many countries around the world, um, students who graduate with online degrees, those online degrees are not recognized by the government for purposes of obtaining jobs with the government. So if you're focused on the private sector, I would argue that uh, your private sector globally is more like the United States experience, that there is no difference between online and face-to-face, -face, but there's definitely regulatory uh, frameworks in place in countries outside of the U.S. that do make an online degree less desirable for those who want to go okay. into government. Uh, I'm going to merge two questions from the audience. We still have more than... 14 questions other than the poll uh, to go through. And to the audience, I'm gonna put a poll right now or after asking, finishing asking the question, if you would like to extend the time um, for maybe 15 minutes, we'll, 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 I'll post it in, in a minute or two. Um, Rana and Tamara from the audience ask two, I'm going to merge their questions together, um, which is about social life and the whole university experience. How does that go on the online? That was Rana's question. And Tamara was wondering what to do at the beginning of the academic year. Do you have anything interesting to, for the students to know each other, even if they were an online cohort? So, um, what's your uh, uh, opinion on these two, or your experience on these two questions? So, it, that, that, those are great questions, and, and I think um, what I'm seeing is an evolution uh, happening over time. I think ASU Online were, was targeting a population of students initially that were older, that uh, had families, uh, that often already were working in the workplace full time. Uh, and in many cases, there wasn't an emphasis on the social experience outside the classroom, although building community within the classroom has always been a, a priority. But outside the classroom, initially, it was not a priority. 
However, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing our, our most uh, fastest growing population are the first time first year freshmen. And so as this has happened, students have expressed a greater and greater interest for those types of opportunities. They started to create them on their own. Uh, Facebook is, is one of the mediums that the students uh, initially started when we caught on and, and saw what was happening. Uh, Casey Francis, uh, one of my colleagues at Ed Plus started to engage these students. They're now in the process of, of creating their own student government so that we'd have a student government for our ASU online students as we do for campus. Uh, these students are creating their own clubs, uh, psychology club. I, I met the uh, president of the psychology club the other night at a social where we actually all got together with online students uh, one evening from around the world and, and, and spent time getting to know each other. So that has increased over time. And, and as the interest has increased, we are working very hard to actually create those opportunities and, and build that different experience for our students. Probably the, the most uh, effective long-term experience we've had for our students is education abroad. Uh, and this is something that ASU online students have taken a sig significant advantage of that opportunity to go abroad for learning experiences with the faculty. So they're getting to meet other students, getting to meet, have time with faculty members and have that education abroad experience. We're hoping to create more and more, more of those experiences as we move to hybrid programs, as well as opening up research opportunities and internships for our students. So something else I would say is that on one hand, you're seeing ASU online students, uh, more first time freshmen and more engagement along traditional uh, student services line, but ASU's traditional student services uh, have all been put online as a result of COVID. So for example, uh, welcome orientations that we have for international students and domestic students all of that has moved online. Student clubs, uh, whether it's academic and, or just for fun, cultural clubs are all online. Um, faculty will do guest lectures and seminar series that again would typically be done face-to-face. -face. Those have moved online. And there's a whole series of virtual internships that ASU students are accessing. So I think it's both sides that both the traditional or the student services that were focused on the campus students have moved online and the ASU online infrastructure All right, has incorporated I'll more student services. Go to the polls. Um, audience seems to agree with up to myth number four. However, myth number three, we have another split, almost 50-50 which was the online, uh, the quality of online students compared to face-to-face. -to -face. 53 agreed it's a myth and 47%, 53% and 47% says true face-to-face uh, -face is make better students or better graduates. So would you like, uh, Julie, would you like another shot at uh, getting more, getting your votes more secured. I've got to, I got to get you to, to, to sway over. So I think it's really important to understand the two different populations. Uh, you know, the campus population can, can often be a, a very traditional and select population. And so in many cases, those students coming in, uh, I think Julia referenced this, uh, are going to be successful no matter what uh, in, in terms of how they've been selected in terms of admissions requirements. I think when you look at the ASU online students, these students are often coming from a, a much d diverse uh, perspective. And, you know, once again, those students are given the opportunity to construct more based on what they learned in that online environment. They're giving more formative assessments, so they're actually able to take that knowledge and create new content, new material, and that often helps students to be able to go out in the workforce and have the skills 
that our industries and uh, the workforce is demanding from our students. Um, and once again, they typically are older and come into the education with a higher level of experience and skill set. And this, that maturity allows them to actually gain more from the learning experiences than our more traditional first time, first year students. So I, I think, um, I, I actually don't know that it's a good idea to compare the two uh, because I, I think it's, uh, we're having success with all populations of these students. We're starting to understand how each of the different modalities support students in the best way. And so therefore we're starting to blend more and take more of those opportunities and spread them out across the different modalities to make sure that we're supporting the success of all the different students. And I think with COVID and, and what's happened with ASU Sync, that's where you're really seeing that happen uh, in a very dynamic and rapid fashion. And ASU was, I think, positioned perfectly to be able to respond to COVID. And once again, what we're learning with our campus students, we're using that in ASU Online and what we have for ASU Online, we're now using to support our campus students. And ultimately, I think you're gonna see really just a blending across all the modalities and focusing not on face-to-face -face students versus an online student, but really just focusing on what's in the best interest of each student, creating that personalized educational experience and creating just uh, a greater intelligence across um, uh, our I'm society. I'm going to two questions also together. However, um, I agree with, with Julie that probably the comparison is um, not fair or even not necessary, especially that the audience did agree that myth number eight, that one takes from the other. So they, that online s students are a different segment than the face-to-face -face students. So, so they seem to be agreeing with that. Okay, I'm gonna merge questions by Iyad and Sharif. Iyad wants to know more on uh, the, the, the technical of how do you minimize or combat cheating? So probably if you mention few of, of the software products, not for the sake of advertising, but what exactly, what, what soft, it's good to know what software ASU is using. And uh, Sharif actually is asking about the under, uh, the other end of the spectrum. How do you recognize the more hardworking students? How do you reward um, that? Is it any different from face to face, or is is it still the same um, process when when you mark students, uh, when you give them grades and things uh, like that? Okay, so let, let, let me take on the, the first question around cheating. Uh, so currently right now, um, we use a proctoring software. Uh, uh, the company that we're engaged with right now is, is called RP Now. Uh, and it, it's kind of interesting because I, I have um, two, I, I have three boys uh, and two of my boys are ASU online students. So I actually get to, to see and, and hear all about their experience uh, in ASU online. And so with, with RP now, uh, what my son does is um, he has to uh, log into a, a link through the learning management system. Uh, it takes him to the test. And before he starts the test, he kind of has to use the camera and guide the camera around the room, show his learning environment, show that he doesn't have a, a cheat sheet or anything that hasn't been approved by the instructor that's out there. They have to you know, show their, uh, turn their head to make sure that they don't have earbuds. Uh, they show their arms. Uh, the camera has to be positioned so that it can see the student the entire time as they're taking the test. Uh, that all gets recorded. Uh, at the end of the test, that gets reviewed by someone to make sure that uh, there was no cheating uh, or communications uh, during the exam with the student. And so once again, it, it's actually, uh, I think, much more foolproof uh, around preventing cheating on an exam uh, than you would have 
um, in a classroom because uh, trust me, um, having taught for 15 years, it's very difficult to prevent cheating in a classroom. Uh, students are, you know, often positioned very closely together and they are able to actually see what each other is doing. Uh, we also have the ability to lock down the browser so that they can't uh, use the uh, internet while they're taking a test. We also have software that measures uh, for common phrases when students uh, have writing assignments so that we can detect uh, plagiarism. And we actually train the students to use that software themselves so that they can detect when they may have uh, plagiarized unintentionally and it gives them the opportunity to make sure or to correct that before they hand in uh, an assignment. In terms of, of marking students' grades, that's going to vary dramatically, you know, uh, uh, as it does on campus, um, depending on the faculty member. Uh, I think the benefit that I see with online courses is you have a significantly higher amount of um, work where students are constructing either essays, papers, uh, arguments, uh, equations, or theories that allow the faculty member and the instructional team to give feedback to the students. In, in many of our face-to-face -face models, there's uh, an emphasis on summative assessments, uh, and often summative assessments that are uh, implemented in a way to where there's often little or no feedback to the student in terms of helping them to construct something. And often they come uh, after the fact. And so once again, uh, students often don't go back uh, to review how did I do on the exam? Were there any comments? And so once again, I, I think that emphasis on the formative learning process is really one of the, the most significant advantages to online education. And as I mentioned earlier, what we've learned from that is now migrating back and changing the classroom and the learning experience for our, our, our campus um, faculty and, um, and campus I'll go classrooms. to the chat and then I'm going to end with, with probably one or two more questions at most. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We've already actually extended our time, uh, but maybe no more than 10 minutes. Um, on, on the polls, um, and this is quite surprising to me because I thought many would, would uh, agree with the myth rather than it is a myth, which is number five, teaching science online. Uh, a healthy 83% actually think, of course you can, only 17% of the 70% of the audience that answered think that you cannot. Uh, I agree that you can teach science, I just could, didn't expect the audience would agree um, that forcefully. Um, they also agreed 85% about the profit. They agree you know that they, you can teach science. They're in agreement with you that it is it is a myth. Um, please do. I, I do want to. Can I make a quick comment on that? Um, uh, it, it's so interesting because um, you know many of the universities that I work with, and and my former uh, university, which also has an outstanding uh, online program, has most are very resistant to bring science programs online uh, and very resistant to, to bringing labs online. And, and so this is an area where uh, I think ASU Online has excelled. And, and those programs are, are growing immensely because we're the only science programs from an R1 uh, institution that are available globally. And, and so um, I, I appreciate your audience. I think they're ahead of the curve. I'm going to give them uh, an A plus on that uh, particular wait, assignment. Wait, wait, there is uh, and, myth number two, com there is myth number two coming up. Keep working. Uh, so hold on for that A plus. You might change your mind. 
On myth number two, that cheating is easier online. Uh, Sixty-five percent think that it is easier and it's a real problem, whereas only thirty-five percent say that not necessarily uh, true. So, but we already covered the cheating, so I don't. Th I think we'll go to uh, number one. It's a sixty forty. Forty percent of the audience. Uh, think that going you go online to make money. Uh, Sixty percent agree that no, it is more expensive to produce, and that is not for the money. I will try. Unfortunately, I cannot cover all the questions, and I apologize. But I would like to ask two questions. Um, and Fahed is asking, what suggestions do you have around issues of well-being of both students and faculty, considering the stress and the challenges related to online education? And for us, especially under the COVID-19, uh, you know, added layer of stress and anxiety. That, uh, so on, 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 under this compound effect of stress, what is your advice or what is your experience on how to handle it? Julia, there, did you have? Yes, there is a particular service, and I forget the name of it, and I, that's not really the point, but there is actually a service that, and Julia, you can help me make sure I'm saying this wrong, which is part and available to all ASU online students that focuses on mental health counseling. And they have people that um, are placed around the world, I believe, in multiple languages, Julie, if I'm not mistaken. And so it is an additional service that ASU provides to our online students. So an additional service I mentioned, the student success coaches, well, they can be very helpful on things like time management and goal setting. But when it comes to actual mental health issue, there is a separate uh, um, technology and service that we contract with to make that available to ASU online students. Yeah, so I, I absolutely agree with uh, Julia. And, and I, I think the success coaches are, are critical to facilitating that. So often the success coach in a conversation with this success coach is the first line of engagement on supporting the stress of a student. Uh, they work very hard to engage the student early on uh, each student is assigned a success coach. We try to keep that same success coach with that student throughout their entire journey. So they're able to build that relationship. And when needed, we have these other resources such as uh, um, uh, psychological services that are available that the coaches can guide students to that resource as well as other resources on campus. So certainly, I, I think uh, stress, you know, I actually see that at home with my kids. Um, so I, I actually think I'm their success coach, but I, I think having someone to go to is critical. Uh, I, I think the uh, something else that I've seen is, is the tools that we're creating to build community within the classroom allow students to actually help reduce each other's stress. And, and so some of these tools are communication tools where a student can say, is anyone else having this problem with RP now? Is anyone else having uh, this problem? Or did someone else, uh, how did you do this assignment? Did, what does this mean uh, that we're supposed to do peer review? And so the students themselves actually with that community provide a significant amount of support uh, to each other. For faculty, uh, I, I think you know the faculty always have each other. Uh, we're really promoting uh, more and more team models of instruction. So faculty are on a team. And then instructional designers actually not only are fantastic at helping faculty design their courses, but they're also another way which we're able to sense the stress level of our faculty and then we can extend additional resources to actually help faculty in areas where we know that they're experiencing high levels of stress. And, and honestly, the instructional designers, because they have built such strong relationships with the faculty, they are 
a great support system for the faculty when things can become stressful. Well, with that, unfortunately, I'm going to have to end on behalf of CAFUS, the CAFUS education team, myself and all the audience. Thank you both for a uh, wonderful uh, webinar and presentations. I look forward to our next uh, event. To the audience, I will remain in the chat for the next few minutes in case you have any last minute comments or observations that help would help us improve the presentations. Thank you. Uh, I stopped myself from, I don't know why this is not working. Uh, uh, okay. I stopped myself from saying the joke or making the reference between your two first names, but I think it's, it's good to end it. Um, if you don't know, audience, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you might want to go to IMDB and just plug in the first two, two first names, excuse me, of our two wonderful speakers. Um, it's a very nice movie. It won't be as uh, informative and as warm as our presentation was, but I think it will be a good way to end your evening. Um, for you two ladies, thank you very much for taking the time, and I look forward to our next presentation. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.